Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar in which we will ask the question whether COVID-19 will kill journalism as much as it's claimed so many other lives. My name is Franz Kruger. I'm head of department at WITS Journalism. Um, this is our second webinar in a series. If anyone wants to listen back to last week's event, event uh, which dealt with fake news, um, you will find it on our website, journalism.co.za. I must say that I really enjoyed that discussion and I'm looking forward to today's. Um, I hope that uh, the technology is working for everyone. Uh, please use the chat function on the right hand side to message us if you have a problem and hopefully the technological gods will stay with us through the course of the next hour. Um, we have a, um, this Zoom uh, webinar as uh, where you are and then we have an additional channel on Facebook Live um, which we opened last week because we had far more interest than we anticipated. Um, and it seemed to work for some people, so we've opened that again. If you want to um, participate in Facebook uh, rather than on Zoom, uh, then that would be where you could go, facebook.com forward slash Jocosa, J-O-C-O-Z-A. -O -O um, I wonder who is here. Uh, I asked this question last week as well. We had a lot of international interest. Please, if you're from outside of South Africa, perhaps just in the chat um, function, just tell us where you're from, so we have a sense of, of uh, where we're reaching. Um, I'm just going to share uh, the, a couple of house rules, as it were. Um, give me a moment. Here we go. So you should see um, the uh, uh, the welcome welcome slide there for today's uh, for today's events, um, and then just three points that we wanted to make. As I've said in the past, tweet early, tweet often, uh, and please use the hashtag hashtag midweek webinar so that we can extend the conversation beyond this immediate environment. Um, I've talked about the chat function on the right, which we tend to use for any technical issues. Um, and internal com communication. If you have contributions to make to the discussion, questions uh, or comments, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you're on Facebook Live, um, please, you can post your questions in the comment section. Uh, mm -hmm. We will be watching that also and then introduce that into the conversation wherever we can, wherever it's productive. We are recording. Um, and we will make it publicly available afterwards, the recording of the webinar. Um, and we assume that your participation means that you're okay with that. Um, so I'm going to just stop that for a second. Um, so we're newbies as, at using this format. We're feeling our way. So um, please bear with us. Last week seemed to work reasonably well, despite a glitch in the middle. Um, like many others, we're trying to find new ways of connecting and keeping the conversation flowing. Uh, and of course, as we're finding these technical platforms are not just things that we have to get used to in a technical sense. Um, there are lots of unforeseen consequences, I guess, that arise. Um, it's interesting to see how many webinars are on, are on offer at the moment. And what is interesting to me is that you begin to notice things over time. Um, as the weeks go on under the South African lockdown, you are in meetings with the same sets of people um, time and again, and you begin to notice things about them. Um, you begin to notice, for instance, that some of them are really feeling the lack of hairdressers and barbers. They start <laughs> over time a little bit, shall we say, unkempt. Others, of course, seem to have some sort of in-house solution, or maybe there is a black market out there of hairdressers um, that I don't know anything about. I can feel the groundswell building that hairdressers and barbers need to be declared an essential service. But more seriously, the topic of discussion today is of course the economic impact of the COVID crisis on the media and on journalism. Much as the whole economy is bleeding, the media are face facing quite catastrophic circumstances. We hear about retrenchments, possible closures, salary cuts, um, in a range of different media houses, not just in South Africa, but across the world. And of course, this comes at the worst possible time for society. Everyone understands, I think, the, the absolute essential necessity 
um, of accurate and trusted information that it need that we need it under the present circumstances. Last week we discussed the explosion of fake news that has engulfed the world. It seems to feed off the profound anxieties that I think we all feel and the isolation that we have to live through. Fact checkers are having a busy time and there's rarely been a greater need for trusted journalism. The economic crisis of the media in many ways exacerbates a problem that has been exercising us for a long time. As we all know, the traditional business model, which rests on subscriptions and advertising, um, is simply dying. And the present crisis may be speeding up a process that was unfolding anyway. The Indian author Arundhati Roy has spoken of the pandemic as a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. In a hugely influential article that I think initially appeared in The Guardian and was subsequently reproduced in various places, she urges us to leave behind the baggage of old ideas and walk through the portal lightly, ready to imagine and fight for a new world. Perhaps it is time for journalists to follow that advice and to reimagine and remake a new information economy that can sustain the journalism that we will continue to need, not only under the COVID lockdown, but well into the future. We will hear in a minute from the front lines of the crisis, but I was struck by a story from Limpopo, which comes to us via the Pointer Institute in Florida. The Limpopo Mirror is a small local newspaper in Mercado, formerly Louis Trichard, that punches far above its weight. It has built up a real national reputation for hard hitting and influential investigative journalism, but now faces exactly the economic pressures we have seen across the media. In an interview with Pointer, the owner, Anton von Sale, says the paper considered closing and waiting out the crisis, but he says it was simply not an option. And I think his words are worth quoting. We simply could not. It would mean our correspondents are without any income. It would mean the small printing company that we use is without an income. But overall, we would not let our communities down. We felt like the band on the Titanic. We must keep on playing. So in those terms, let's begin the discussion. By the way, I'd, I'd hoped that Anton was able to, to join us for at least part of this discussion, but uh, he's on production day, as other editors will know about, and he simply can't get away with a small staff. So let me introduce um, the panelists. Um, we're joined firstly by Khadija Patel, who of course is the editor of the Mail and Guardian, um, and you see her Twitter handle there. Um, I'm not going to go through an entire bio. I'm sure that you can find the details and we only have an hour. So I think we should, we should uh, dispense with those kind of details. Uh, I'm joined by Mohammed Nanabai, who's deputy CEO of the Media Development Innovation Fund. And you have his Twitter handle there. And we have Kandeka Kubule, who's economics editor at the SABC. And uh, you have my uh, Twitter handle there at the bottom. I'm going to take it down, but I'm asking Sepo just to put up those Twitter um, handles on the chat if in case anybody wants to uh, tag any of the panelists. So let's start out with Kadita. I mean, you recently at the Mail and Guardian went public with your particular circumstances to say that salaries at the end of, the April, of April might be at risk um, and you appeal for public support. Can you give us a sense of practically how you got there um, and what has happened since then. Thanks so much, Franz, and thanks to Bits for uh, arranging uh, this webinar. Um, certainly, uh, all discussions around this topic, I think, are needed, but particularly, I think, um, on the African continent. So thank you uh, for arranging this. Um, at the MNG, um, we started off the month of March relatively positively, um, coming out of two bad months, uh, cyclically, bad months, so the low revenue months, January and February. But even though they were cyclically bad, um, there was, you know, we were tracking up year on year um, and we had a plan. Um, you know, there was a lot of energy being invested in turning, um, you know, various parts of the business around. So there was, you know, there was a positivity running through um, the organization. And certainly um, at the beginning of March, when we expect, uh, you know, to make uh, forecasts for what the, you know, for what the month looked like, it, it was meant to be a very good month. Um, 
but very, very quickly it became the stuff of nightmares. Um, by mid-March, we had cancellations uh, from advertisers en masse. And this, was, um, this came after we obviously had to cancel our own live events, uh, which account for about 20% um, of our total revenue mix. Um, and for a small independent news uh, outfit um, that does not sit with um, cash reserves and has no cash reserves actually, um, the impact of, uh, you know, of such cancellations are immediately felt. Um, so uh, already by mid-March, the CEO could uh, address um, staff and take us into his confidence, letting us know that this has potentially uh, adverse, uh, you know, um, it, it will have an adverse impact on uh, our ability to continue running the business in the coming weeks. Um, so that was, it was a sobering moment um, for everyone. Um, we all know the, uh, you know, the problems that, you know, news media facing globally with um, you know, finding new business models and finding, you know, structures within their teams that make sense um, for, you know, for, for, you know, for various um, circumstances. But this moment was rushed up on us. Um, and within the newsroom, we, you know, we, we sat down and thought, how, how, how do we respond to this as journalists? Um, we were covering the story very, very early on. We knew, um, you know, we had an idea of, uh, you know, the impact that COVID-19 would have um, on South Africa, especially looking at what was happening in the rest of the world. But certainly we could not have counted on it impacting us so quickly and so severely. So what we did was we realized that this was the moment to actually show our vulnerability to our public, to our audience, um, with the idea that the Mail and Guardian, like any other news publication, is nothing without its people. And the people that make up any one news publication are not just the newsroom or the people who are employed there, but certainly it's public as well. Um, and for uh, you know, for a long time we had actually been talking about the fact that if we are more open with our with our public about what our circumstances are, we would have um, you know a better chance of actually securing their support and taking them along this journey with us. And so we decided to open up um, at one point um, in that week. I remember um, my deputy Beauregard Trump, who I think is listening in as well, um, telling me, uh, you do know that once we go public with this, you know, everyone knows our business. Um, and I told him, um, you, know, this is, you know, this is a point at which we have no shame. Um, there is no shame. And for me, there was no shame in admitting our vulnerability. Um, and certainly after going public with that, I've been heartened by the response we've received by so many people within the industry, but really um, around the world, people who have rallied around, um, you know, the sustainability of an important news media publication in Africa and want to see it succeeding. So, um, you know, we've ha we, had a, we had a great response, um, you know, from that public appeal. Um, we were able to raise some funding as well, but um, it certainly does not yet um, answer, you know, the long-term question of how we continue to keep the Mail and Guardian going well beyond um, this current crisis, or, you know, if we, if we uh, quantify the current crisis as the next two months. Um, and for that, uh, you know, we've had to have very hard, um, you know, discussions uh, and take very hard decisions as well. So staff have agreed to take uh, hefty salary cuts, um, and, you know, this is very much in line with what's happening um, elsewhere in the world and elsewhere in South Africa as well. Um, so it is a, you know, France, to answer your question of what's happened afterwards, um, 
what's happened is we have been fortified by the knowledge uh, of the support for the Mail and Guardian that exists, but we have also had to make very um, you know, tough decisions within the organization to ensure that the MNG continues to be. Thanks very much, Khadija. Um, so, uh, is this? Are you optimistic that this uh, that you'll come through this okay? I don't think anyone can be uh, optimistic right now. Um, I prefer to uh, chunk up the future right now in three month intervals, um, and I think that you know we need to you know just ensure that we're still here in three months and then another three months and then another three months for me that's what um you know that's how we have to uh you know that's how we have to nav navigate this crisis because there are so many unknowns um we don't know what the economy is going to look like um in a couple of months time and we don't know what that um you know what that impact is going to have um you know on us so um what I am optimistic about France, you know, to answer the question that this, you know, of this webinar is that this virus will not kill journalism. Journalism will continue to survive. Um, journalism is integral to us understanding each other and understanding this world and understanding time. Journalism will survive. Um, the business of journalism will have to evolve very, very radically. And I think that in the coming months, we may have, to have, may have very difficult conversations with ourselves within organizations about how we run news businesses and what the object of um, a news business ultimately is. Um, so those, um, you know, those are, I think, questions though down the line. For now, however, I think what is crucial um, is for us to remember that journalism will not die um, so over the weekend, I, um, I saw that it was 25 years since the Oklahoma City bombing. So I was about 11 years old when that happened. But I think that it is, the f I remember that, that day very, very clearly because it was the first time that I felt the instinct to be a journalist. Because I remember that, I remember watching this um, on television. I remember being intrigued by the story, horrified, but I remember wanting to write about it. I remember wanting to make sense of it for someone. And I, and I remember telling my parents that I want to write about this. And my mom said, well, go and do it. And I opened up a small A5 notebook and I wrote a couple of sentences and I didn't know what to do with it afterwards. So that instinct for human beings to tell the story of their world will not die and this virus will not kill that well that's um that's good to hear and i guess it's that kind of drive that keeps us all going um but mohammed tell us about some of the practical advice that you're giving um uh, media houses and publishers i mean it's one thing of course to say that it can't die but um i mean we've got to do stuff to make sure that it in fact does turn the corner as as, as khadija suggests well, thank you franz and uh Thank you, Khadija, for really taking us through what's going on at the front lines of this. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful to be invited here. Uh, I was at WITS maybe 20 years ago when I was on the SRC, so it's nice to be back, even if it's just virtually um, at the moment. And, you know, Franz, I think if I start with your question that you asked Khadija at the end and answer that first, uh, whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic. And, you know, I think there's this, there's this quote that goes around international relations departments at universities from William Arthur Ward that says, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, and the realist adjusts the sails. Um, so I think what we've really been trying to do is to adjust the sails and help our clients adjust the sails. Um, and what we've done is, uh, you know, based on our experience in 2008 um, and what we've seen over the with media organizations as the business models have sort of been falling apart over the last two decades is put together a list of recommendations for them, um, which I'll share actually in the chat as well for people to go away and read, but I'm gonna take you very quickly through them. So we sent these to the CEOs of uh, all the companies we've invested in, um, and as well as walk them through in some webinars as well. Um, and really just to 
help people very early on start course correcting um, for this crisis um, and for how they can help their news organizations and their publishers come through this. Um, and very much as Katija said, this is, you know, uh, no one can predict what's going to happen in a month, two months or six months time. So it's very much thinking about how do we survive this and how do we get into survival mode rather than thinking about um, our ambitions that we might have had a month or two months or three months ago. Um, I wonder if you can see these slides, if they've managed to come up for everybody. Yep. Perfect. So I'm going to run through them very quickly if, uh, and happy to take questions afterwards. Um, but the Media Development Investment Fund uh, is a, <clears throat> we're an impact investor um, and we register as a New York nonprofit. And what we do is we provide loans and equity investments as well as technical assistance to media organizations. Um, and the reason why we exist is to support independent media companies to provide them financing uh, that isn't politically tainted, so they don't have to rely on oligarchs or people connected to political parties, um, so they can go ahead and do the important journalism in their countries that they do. Um, we work across the world in 42 countries, including South Africa, where um, we both work with the Mail and Guardian, as well as run something called the South African Media Innovation Program, where we're funding uh, innovative uh, companies as well as assisting uh, other companies making a digital transition. Um, so when we're talking about framing of this question, we're really looking at a number of things. Um, so the first thing we're looking at is collapsing revenues. And as I mentioned, you know, events businesses are gone. Um, for many years, people have been trying to diversify revenue away from just advertising. And events were a critical component of uh, any media company's revenue. And overnight, those have gone away. Um, advertising budgets have been cut as the economies have been locked up. It's one of the uh, areas that any company will cut quickly, um, especially you know, as businesses close down. And we've seen print circulation decrease across the board due to this. Um, the second area is on management and HR within our companies and within portfolio companies. Um, Everybody has now moved to virtual organizations as people can't go into work. Um, so everybody needs to adjust very quickly to working under a new regime. Um, and then there's certainly a safety aspect to the work of journalists um, as they have to go out into the field to cover COVID um, and for organizations to be thinking about this. And finally, um, you know, this virus is taking a real toll on people's lives and people might know people who are infected, who are sick or might have been passed on. Um, and there's an emotional element of this that we need to provide support to as well. Our media organizations need to provide support to for their staff. Um, and finally, you know, um, there's a real crisis uh, that exists in the world, and this is often an excuse being used by many in power to censor the media, to attack the media. Um, sometimes there's pressure on journalists and news organizations, um, information becomes politicized, um, there's misinformation going around. Um, perhaps we've not seen that as much in South Africa, although there are reports going on, but in other countries you see this quite... Uh, strongly and people using this as an excuse to crack down on media organizations. So, you know, when we think about these recommendations, um, really thinking about sustainability and how do we get through this? Um, we recently ran a, uh, a virtual seminar for all of our um, organizations that we work with um, and we brought over um, someone from an Italian news organization. And as you know, they've been hit the hardest by COVID. Um, and one of the really uh, important statements that came out of this was, you know, uh, uh, from Giovanni Zagni was a, cr a crisis like this will magnify any problem that you already had within your organization. Um, so if you had a cash problem, it would magnify it. If you had a management problem, it would be magnified. Um, and whatever other issues that you had, if you had a business model problem, these would be magnified. Um, and this is, you know, not just, we see, don't just see this in news organizations, I guess we see this in uh, businesses around the world as well. Um, so what we've been telling our clients is the first thing they need to do is cut costs immediately and to conserve cash and to do this very early on. Because the longer you wait, it means the more cash that you, you're burning and you need this cash to see yourself through this crisis. Um, remember, we're in survival mode. Um, so people need to build and manage cash reserves. Um, this crisis is dislocating business models and any projections that you may have had. So there needs to be rigorous cash flow management. Um, 
many of our clients have already started reforecasting the downside scenarios. People are looking at revenue drops from 30% to 70%, um, some even more than that. Um, they're thinking about the how long this would last and people are projecting three to 18 months. Um, so this is significant for businesses that are running on a month to month basis without any buffer. Um, so the only way to get through something like this is to immediately cut costs across the organization, um, especially when you're looking at this revenue reduction and reforecasting. Um, we've been telling organizations that uh, it's preferable um, as you start cutting costs because obviously in most news organizations, uh, your HR cost is your biggest bill. Um, it's people that make up our newsrooms, um, the rest of our organizations. Um, and of course, you know, during a pandemic is the worst time to be laying people off. Um, people require health care and health coverage. So uh, our advice early on was to um, look at doing a cost the board uh, salary cuts in the organization um, in order to try to protect jobs. Um, and of course, if you know, organizations can get to this, that's great. Um, it will allow them to um, keep their staff on board, keep health benefits and so on as they move through. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough thing to do. And it's a tough thing for people to hear. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's the only way you come through something like this. Um, so, cash, cash. Um, and the next thing is, you know, as we start thinking about our people and thinking about our content. Um, and of course, the, you know, the reason we're all in journalism and in this business um, is to serve the public, to serve our audiences, um, to hold power to account. And you know, this work that our journalists are doing across the world can literally save lives. Um, so we need to pri prioritize this. We need to make sure that we're delivering um, content that's in the public interest, that's helping people. Um, so anything that we can do uh, in terms of thinking about our content strategy, adjusting the content strategy, throwing out our editorial calendars, redoing them, thinking about the types of content that we do, um, is critical um, and becomes a team effort in doing this. Um, and it also becomes kind of time as much as we've, you know, uh, the framing of this question was quite doom and gloom. Um, but of course, you know, this is a time when audiences are growing. Uh, people are consuming more news and more journalism. They want to know what's going on in the world. Um, they've got the time often to consume it. Um, so it's a time of growth for people. Um, and that can translate um, into either higher programmatic revenues, but that might fall off the cliff soon as well, or into other ways to monetize the audience, whether that's through subscribers or members. Mohammed, if you could start wrapping up, if you don't mind. Yep, I've just, uh, I'm nearly done. So um, really looking at this content and moving through, um, focusing on our audiences, um, tapping into our networks, looking at the partnerships that we have. Of course, we are under pressure with our staff, people may be sick, um, and so on. So we're going to not need to get creative in how we produce our work and how we get out there. Um, often working with partners um, and creating alliances helps us get through this um, because we know we don't have the resources to spend as much as we used to um, in this. Um, I'm not going to go through too much of this just because of time. Um, I'll post a link to this. Um, and of course, the most important thing is your team is not immune. Um, and publishers and newsrooms need to make sure that they're thinking about their staff, um, thinking about well-being, thinking about how they're running their ships um, in order to make sure that they can continue producing journalism, serving their audiences um, and taking care of people. Um, so thank you. thank you very much. Um, uh, that's great. And, and I'm sure that there will be lots of points that we would want to come back to. Um, Tandeka, can you give us a sense of um, what the broader picture is? I mean, what you're hearing about the media in general, uh, both here and abroad. I mean, it seems like we're actually simply experiencing the same impact as the rest of the economy. Why would the, the media be any different? Yes, um, I think that we are particularly vulnerable because we were at the end of a, a business model that has been in place for almost um, as long as the, the sort of like traditional print media has been going. And that is this dependency on advertising revenue. So we've, see, we've seen plunging revenue and we've seen decreased advertising um, spend with us. And um, we've seen major um, shortfalls in all kinds of areas. 
and especially with print, but also public broadcasting is in danger. Um, le let me um, just tell you a story about how, um, we, how we've begun to worry about public broadcasting and um, the survival of this model. Um, you may know that we are um, a public broadcaster that has a pretty commercial broadcasting um, business model. Um, under 5% of our revenue comes from the public purse and 95% um, of the, our revenue comes from advertising and license fees. Now, um, during our discredited days, license fees was um, a target of protest as the public refused to pay for license fees. And so that left um, advertising. So that advertising, which didn't abandon us during our discredited days, um, and remained with us. Um, so a lot of it came back recently over the past um, 18 months. But now we are seeing the cancellation of adverts and um, advertising revenue is beginning to dwindle and it's exposing the weaknesses in the public broadcasting um, model that we've chosen, which is the, the, the one that relies heavily on, um, on advertising. Now, um, Prior to the COVID crisis, um, many public broadcasters across the world moved to a, a gentle tax um, levied across, it's an imperceptible tax levied across the general population to cover the costs of broadcasting or to increase the public contribution to public broadcasting. But um, our national treasury has um, typically and resisted um, any attempts to get a prescribed tax um, for public broadcasting. Um, the minister told us that um, basically the mandarins inside Treasury have got ideological bl blinkers when it comes to prescribed taxes of that kind. But we knew um, 18 months ago that the model um, is, is, is teetering and it cannot survive any major shock. Um, to, to the economy. So um, the major shock to the economy that has happened on both the demand side and the supply side has meant um, the devastation of the revenues. Now we are cruising at, at the moment on a bailout which arrived a few months ago, but two thirds of that bailout have been exhausted as we sought to settle our debts to external parties that we could prevent the organization from being um, taken to court and um, being liquidated by our creditors. So we've just recovered and here we are now um, in need of the other tranche of the bailout, which is no longer secure because of um, the reallocation of um, funds by National Treasury, um, understandably, towards the COVID virus um, efforts. So um, part of that 500 billion is going to involve the top slicing of the SOE allocations and their reallocation towards um, various packages within that 500 billion um, stimulus package. So we are sitting in a very precarious position indeed. Um, but anyway, um, in, in, in our, our um, advertising dependent model is an anomaly globally and really shouldn't be the case. And so there's an opportunity to raise the flag for public broadcasting and to argue for it and to, um, to, 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 to do some advocacy work for an appropriate model for public broadcasting because frankly, public broadcasting has never been more needed now. And independent, um, public-minded, high-spirited public broadcasting is what we really should be doing at the moment. And really this, this model is going to bring us to our knees. Yeah, so um, we also made um, several mistakes. Um, here in our response to the pandemic. For example, we did research across the world on how um, media houses in broadcasting have responded to the pandemic and how they are trying to keep staff safe, keep staff employed, keep freelancers on board. Um, the mistake we made was not to follow the example of Rai TV in Italy and um, China TV, well, the Chinese. What they did was they noticed that a lot of learning would go online and on TV. So they took to TV 
um, school on TV, and that increased um, TV viewership and consumption. They developed a model of um, content or journalism, which was edutainment and, and news all melanged into one format. And that increased um, viewership across, um, I mean, among public broadcasters. But even as we had presented a document to this effect, we, we were very lax and we didn't we took too much time in implementing the the move to um tv um school on tv um and our opposition ate up our lunch on that score um so multi choice went um on on school on tv before us and so did um well e announced a massive program and our program is minuscule which it shouldn't be um when compared to theirs but um, this much. is not. Sandeka, can we? Um, thanks very much for drawing our attention to the particular circumstances of the SABC, which I think is a really important player, and of course, as you say, um, you know, has, is very dependent on advertising. Can I um, uh, ask the broader question? Maybe throw it at Mohammed first. Is I mean, you've mentioned and Khadija's mentioned that the business model, um, you know, is really coming to an end. Um, is this not a process of culling of some sort and that the weak uh, will collapse and maybe that's a good thing to be provocative to bring us into a new kind of set of circumstances and a new, um, a new environment? You're talking about Aaron Duty's new door and a um, new world that we have to fight for by just graciously going into the new door. No, I think that um, there are things in the... In, in the current infrastructure for journalism that needs to be saved. And I think that we must um, save some of the ships and um, especially public broadcasting as, as we know it. I don't think that all is wrong with the, the, the model. I don't think that this is a natural culling. I think that we can construct better policy environments for the um, success of um, journalism and public broadcasting in particular. Thanks very much. Any other thoughts about the wider implications of this from either Mohammed or, or Khadija? I, sure, Francis. You know, I think there's, it's, it's a difficult time to be discussing the broader issues of business models in journalism uh, when you're going through a crisis like this. Um, because, you know, your focus is on how do I pay my bills today? Um, rather than what am I thinking about for the long term. Um, but of course, for the last two decades, we've been seeing um, a transition in the model. You know, the advertising markets opened up. Facebook, Google, and others have taken a large share of advertising that would have been, you know, going to publishers of one sort or the other in the past. Um, so in one way, it's, you know, uh, these technologies has helped democratize publishing. You know, anybody, anybody can go and write online and start a new publication quite easily without needing big broadcast cameras and OV vans or printing presses. Um, but, the, you know, on the same time, it's affected the way uh, legacy media organizations uh, could pay the bills. So, you know, we've been in this transition. Um, I think, yes, you know, it's, it's putting stresses on legacy media organizations. Uh, many have been in the process of trying to transform. Um, some have done it successfully, um, others not so much. Um, but of course, we've also seen the growth of new players. Um, who have been digital only or mobile only um, coming up. So in a way, you know, uh, you know, on the one hand, we can be worried that this is putting immense pressure on existing organizations, but it's also provided immense opportunity for many others to build something new. Um, and we're seeing this in many markets where digital first players are doing really innovative work, um, reaching their audiences directly, um, you know, creating uh, conversations with those audiences. Um, so I think it's a balance um, and we need to, you know, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't want to say it's a culling. I don't think that's the right language. I think just in this environment, it's really difficult for people. Um, but certainly it's going to uh, put stresses on any business uh, models or business plans that people had that weren't at least breaking even prior to this. I mean, as you say, um, you know, it is a difficult moment to talk about these things, but at the same time, it is exactly the right moment to be thinking about the future. As you say, also, there is a real opportunity here. Um, I just want to remind everyone, we're uh, talking here to Khadija Patel from the Mail and Guardian, uh, Mohammed Nanabai of, of the MDIF, um, and Tandeka Kubule of the, of the SABC about the 
economic impact of the COVID crisis on journalism. My name is Franz Kruger um, from um, Wits Journalism. A reminder that if you have uh, questions and, and points that you can make them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I've got a couple of questions here and because uh, Mohamed raises the issue of, of, of new technologies and online possibilities, there's a question from Sizani Weza to Khadija about whether you've made much use of mobile um, in, the, in light of the COVID-19 crisis or will wish is supportive of this. Is this a possible future in place of hard copy subscriptions? And maybe I can link that to another question that I noticed earlier, which said, um, why is it that if you're uh, so encouraged, if you're emphasizing so much the, the online opportunities, why are you calling for people to go and buy newspapers? Thanks for that. Um, so uh, actually, you know, our primary call uh, within our public appeal was for people to take out a digital subscription um, and as an added extra buy the paper on your grocery run. Um, but I think the, the bigger point um, that um, that question was making was that the Mail and Guardian, which uh, was the first um, news publication on the continent to have a digital presence, um, has certainly lagged behind in, um, when it comes to uh, innovation in news in recent years. And that's true. Um, and the answers for that are very complex um, and, uh, you know, relate to some of the weaknesses within our organization. Um, and uh, a lot of the explanation of that is actually quite boring and, you know, relates to, um, you know, inefficiencies and, for example, direct digital infrastructure that took, uh, for example, over a year to overhaul. Um, so, yeah, there's, you know, the, the, the thing that I learned very quickly when I got to the MNG and I had only ever worked in the digital news space before I got to the MNG was that, I thought that um, it could be changed very, very quickly. And that, uh, you know, first of all, I mean, I got to the MNG and I wondered what do all these people do here? It was the biggest newsroom I'd ever been part of. Um, and um, you realize that it is, um, you know, and, and MNG is much smaller than most news organizations in South Africa. Um, but it is very difficult to change a legacy environment and a legacy culture um, and change has to happen iteratively um, you have to actually create a culture of enabling change um, and we can't change for the sake of change but rather developing philosophies um, you know that support change uh, positively so um, yeah that uh, you know, is a very long-winded answer um, about you know my experience of digital innovation, etc., and changing cultures within a legacy news space. But um, the question on mobile, um, of course, uh, most of our audience, uh, our digital audience, I, I think upwards of eighty percent of our digital audience um, access us through mobile. Um, and so that's a huge audience. Um, as Mohammed, um, you know, uh, alluded, um, or like every other news organization around the world, we've enjoyed a very healthy bump in traffic. Um, and that is heartening for me. Um, and again, supports my view that journalism will not die because in a moment of crisis, people actually seek out um, journalism. Um, but, um, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is, um, you know, how do we create products, particularly for uh, editorial products for a digital audience? Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's where, um, you know, where a lot of people are thinking. Um, at the MNG, we uh, actually have a, a very different mobile reading experience than what you'd get from um, your website because we use an ad ops uh, um, service called Marfield, which basically reskins our um, you know our website. Um, so when you access the MNG on mobile, you're getting a very different um, reading experience, um, and that it's it's advertising heavy. Um, so that's you know something that you know that we've been able to now have good data to make a decision about whether we want to continue with, um, you know, an external ad ops um, that uh, operated that does not allow us much room to 
actually cater to our audiences better. But at the same time, we also, um, you know, we, uh, the MNG, uh, you know, has been in, in, in this position of, you know, of crisis for a long time. And so we, um, so, you know, we, we have lots of ideas. So last week we launched an experiment specifically for mobile. We launched a WhatsApp PDF um, edition called The Continent um, for uh, basically for a Pan-African audience um, and specifically uh, repurposing our journalism about the rest of the continent. We, we are the only publication in South Africa that uh, you know, that prioritizes and invests in original journalism from the rest of the continent. So we are experimenting with that. Um, this is, of course, a mobile experiment. So we're trying to figure out how a version of a PDF for, um, you know, for a mobile audience, particularly a pan-African mobile audience would work. Um, so we're still, it's an experiment. Um, those of you who are interested, um, you know, I, I'll drop the links there for you to register. Um, we're still trying to figure out how do you then count an audience, um, you know, in this way? How do we uh, circumvent some WhatsApps, um, you know, uh, ability to stop forwarding? Um, so it is an experiment, but, um, you know, um, Mohammed's colleague Bilal, who's I think in the audience as well, um, he told me a few weeks ago that as much as um, you know this is a crazy time and it's a very difficult time, the 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 benefit of this time is that it does also allow us to just try our try it our ideas and. Um, if it's not perfect, people are likely to be more forgiving of imperfection at this time than at any other. So um, hopefully that uh, gives others also some encouragement. Um, thanks very much. Um, I have a question here from um, Cezanne, also from, from Cezanne Weza. Um, uh, Tsepo, if you could unmute Cezanne. Uh, and if you could put, ask a question about the, the costs going, the spending on on uh, on risk and training and such like. Are you there? Because I think uh, it's become too expensive for newspapers to train, uh, skill, and also provide protective equipment for their journalists who go around and are exposed to some of these COVID uh, coronavirus uh, 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 disease, and so the question is how how much are media houses spending on that, if at all, and is it part of the government uh, package that has been announced, like in South Africa, where some institutions are being rescued? I mean, who is taking these costs? Thank you very much. And um, if I can just slightly broaden that question and say. Do any of you are any of you aware of media companies that are, that are making taking advantage of the government bailout packages that are on offer? Um, can I jump in sure. there? Please. Um, the the big media companies um, like independent that are um, that are thinking of um, well last month they paid people half their salary and then in the months that. Um, are ahead. We're not sure whether they will um, pay people at all, but they are beginning to pay people off. Um, they are not in a position exactly to, because of the past and because of the whole PIC saga, to qualify for some of the funding that's going around and um, owe loads of money to the PIC now, according to the PIC report. So that's a big problem because some of their journalists are out on the streets trying to freelance or to get um, work from um, institutions like us. So um, here, here we need to think very creatively as a, an industry and as journalists about issues of solidarity. And we need to find a way of pulling resources or a fund together because um, not all media houses will qualify for this funding and not all media owners want to proceed um, with their businesses. And um, retrenchments and um, layoffs are inevitable and payroll cuts likewise. So I think that um, 
the, the, the whole issue of pooling resources, creating funds, and um, supporting emerg on an urgent basis, supporting journalists out there with data, with transport costs. We're getting a lot of calls as um, Africa's largest broadcaster. Um, we're getting a lot of calls from radio stations and community radio stations to say that um, our journalists um, don't even have money to come to work. Our journalists don't have money for data. Um, it's a bit of a bloodbath out there. And um, we, as the editors of the SAPC, have undertaken an initiative to, to pull some kind of funds and to get moving to give support, immediate COVID support for, 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 for journalists because um, whether their media houses um, apply for funding or not is, is, is well, I mean, is not in the journalist's hands. Yeah, that's very encouraging. And thank you, Tandeka. I guess it highlights the sort of solidarity that we all need to show in, in, in different uh, perspectives, just uh, in different areas. Um, just very quickly, Mohammed, uh, I mean, the question really was about spending on training and safety issues. I mean, is that part of your advice package um, that you're giving to, to um, projects that you support? Um, certainly, you know, it's something we've, uh, we've sent out in that note to um, have people look at uh, the duty of care to their staff and to make sure that uh, equipment's available where possible. Um, you know, we've had some clients who very early on uh, started work from home um, as an immediate step, um, even prior to it being mandated by governments. Um, and we've also, you know, had an instance with a client who's looking at bringing on a counsellor um, part-time to be able to assist staff who might be um, going through trauma and would need someone to speak to. Um, so any of these interventions uh, where organizations can, uh, you know, look to help their staff through this moment um, and be more available to them uh, is critical um, moving forward. Thanks very much. I mean, we're rapidly running out of time, but if, um, if, uh, if you could just give your, the, this, um, I've had a question here from Nigeria. Uh, for uh, suggestions of how to raise additional money. Your top three tips, Mohammed. Where to get new money from in these, in these times? Um, you know, I think, I think raising money is always a challenge. Um, but right now, you know, I think the first port of call for most organizations is the government uh, funds that are being deployed. Um, we had a big announcement in South Africa yesterday. Um, in many countries, uh, their funds have been made available for people who, uh, for salary support for journalists. Um, there have been a number of uh, funds uh, that people are trying to pull together. Um, most of them initially have been supporting individual journalists um, who are doing COVID work and to look at COVID projects. Um, but slowly we're seeing uh, other pools of money being made available. Google and Facebook have both announced some money. Um, some foundations have started putting some money up. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, looking at these, when IFRA keeps, uh, is keeping a list of these and some of the other news uh, development, uh, media development organizations, like you'll find these lists online where, you know, foundations and, uh, com you know, some of the platforms are putting money and making them available. Thanks, um, and of course, go to your audiences. I think, uh, you know, the, the campaigns that Katija spoke about with uh, going out and, you know, trying to, um, you know, raise revenue directly from uh, their subscribers and uh, members is uh, crucial right now. Thanks very much. Um, I think we need to bring this to a close. Can we just see whether there is something that we can squeeze in by way of additional questions? No, I think we've covered most of the things that are in the Q and A, um, the Q and A button. Um, so um, thank you very much to all of you. Um, I mean, clearly these are difficult, very difficult times. These are life-threatening times, um, both in a health sense, of course, but also to media as enterprises. And I think Mohammed's kind of set of suggestions very quickly and the presentation that he's shared um, around emergency funds um, are good places to, to, to go to at these times. I know that Sanef um, is also particularly concerned about this and has been circulating lists of grants and opportunities. Um, because as we said at the beginning, journalism matters. It continues to matter at this time and will continue to matter um, after we are part, um, after we are past uh, the worst of this. Although as we're increasingly realizing, it's a problem that's going to be with us for some time. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thanks to Khadija 
for sharing uh, the Mail and Guardian's story and also that um, very arresting story, I think, from of how um, she got started on the, the course that has taken her into an editorship um, uh, in, in, in one of the more really important publications in the country. Because um, I think that's the passion, I think, that drives all of us. Thanks, Mohammed, for the, the presentation and the links that you've shared um, and the very practical advice that will get us through this. Thanks to Tandeka also for um, focusing us on public journalism and which has, has a particular place in the South African media um, ecosystem. Um, I would ask that the panelists just um, spend a few minutes after we close just looking at the Q&As and seeing whether in writing we can respond to anyone because I do think that we can, um, I think we covered most of the ground but there may be some things that we can, we can deal with in that way. Please feel free to continue um, the discussion on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, uh, and thanks also, I should say, to Tsepo Chabalala, who's held, us together, who's held the prizes together. I want to just, in conclusion, um, share uh, the slide on the, uh, the webinar that we're, doing, that we're doing next week, which will deal with um, the way in which practice, the practice of journalism is, is changing. So next week at this time, uh, we're going to be talking about reporting the COVID crisis, exploring how journalists work is changing as a result of the story. Um, you'll get details in the way that you found this one. Today we had something like 80 participants, including people from Namibia, Uganda, Sweden, Zimbabwe, Mauritius and Nigeria. It was great to have you here. Um, this is an African conversation and I, th I think we hope um, to continue to hold it on that basis. Thanks very much. Have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week as we pursue journalism in all the different ways um, that we're committed to, committed to it. Thank you very much and speak to you again.